we are recording now. I do anything for Halloween? Uh, I'm going to eat my mom's birthday today. Oh, man, that's an interesting birthday. I bet that's fun though with a kid. It is. It's not like having it on Christmas where people are like, it's Christmas, you know, no, you never get presents, I bet, as a kid. Or you do, but I'm sure like uh, you get the same amount you would have. Yeah. Do you guys do Halloween much? Is it a big thing in England? or? Because I know it technically comes from Ireland, but... But like, I guess, yeah, it's for when I would put like, you know, on my road or roads, and then we would get out kind of this. Huh. So did well, you go somewhere else, or did you just go without getting? When I was younger, I didn't really like that I worked for maybe at the early years of high school, so when I was like 11, 12, I'd go with my friends who was in the Gopric area, and get mashed with them. No, it's like that here too. But we do it. We do it on Halloween, like oh, yeah. actual Halloween. If it's a school night, you mm -hmm. go on Halloween. Like, I don't understand the overhead where you do it. If it's yeah. a school night, you go on the weekend. Yeah. It's so long. I don't know if that's a West Virginia thing or just a new thing. Because when I was a kid living down south, it was always on Halloween, regardless of the day. I think that's the excitement. Like even if it's on like school day, you think, oh, I guess that late tonight. Just go get food, like good sweets. Yeah. All right. We'll turn the light off, do some announcements, some reminders. Uh, the first reminder is lab is in person, you know, as it has been for the past few weeks. If you get it done before lab, before the before Wednesday, there's a possibility you don't need to come in, but just in case, plan to be here on Wednesday with your computer. Um, also, a second announcement, just like last week, I apologize for taking the weekend off again. I, I spent time with my family. And, Barely did any grading in any um, emails. So if you're wondering why I graded something or emailed you back, that's why I'll get to you as soon as I can. And also, it's a good time to remind you that you know a lot of times I don't grade things quickly on purpose. It's as long as you have it turned in before I get around to grading it, I consider that on time. So it's a little bit for your benefit. Uh, what else? That's it for reminders. Oh, okay. I'm sure by now you guys have heard about your classmates. Uh, what happened to the physicist student and the biology student here. We're all pretty sad that they broke up because uh, they didn't have chemistry. Sorry, I, just wanted to start. I wanted to start it with a joke today. Here. Thank you. Anyway, that's it for announcements and jokes because it is now 8 o'clock on the dot. Any questions about anything? Oh, yes. Uh, you know the what the lab that we might do the lab we put on. Yep, the photosynthesis and respiration lab. Yeah. I swear, I'm still not got like the lab grade to be. So you looked at it, and I haven't left any left you in the comments. I don't think so. I'll take a look. So for anybody else too, that's a good question. If you think you haven't gotten your grade back for the lab, the lab, not even the lab report, but the photosynthesis respiration lab. Well, first of all, I'm going to take a look at it, make sure I haven't left you any comments uh, on grades. And then if you if, you, if you haven't, then uh, send me an email and I'll figure something out. As far as I know, off the top of my head, everybody's lab has been graded. Any other questions? That was a good one. Okay, let's see. First word for attendance is going to be candy, since we're talking about Halloween. Candy. Well, we left off 
on Friday talking about animal viruses. Um, then we got up to this point, which is the process of science. As always, I'm going to skip it. As always, I recommend reading it. And as always, there'll be no questions about it on the exam, but there might be some questions about it on the lab, I mean, the uh, study guide. So speaking of which, speaking of study guides, remember, chapter 10 is the last chapter that's going to be on the next exam. So unless something goes horribly wrong today, we're going to finish chapter 10 today, which means the exam should be coming up um, this week or next week. Speaking of which, if you have an opinion on when you'd like to have the exam, whether it be Wednesday or Friday or next Monday, send me an email and let me know because I'm flexible. Oh yeah, sorry, one more last thing about that because I know one student doesn't like to have a big gap between when we finish it and when we take the exam and I understand that. So if you're one of those students and I'm like, hey, we're going to take the exam next week and you're like, I want to take it earlier, that's fine. You can always take it earlier. Just let me know and we'll make arrangements for you to take it earlier. Anyway, process of science. Let's skip it. We need science. Just kidding. Obviously, we're here for that. Oof. Man, getting there. All right, and we're almost done. Next thing we're going to talk about is the HIV virus, um, and then we're going to talk about prions. HIV virus is interesting, so it's not necessarily that it's important that you know specifically about HIV, uh, but one of the big things, one of the reasons we included is because it's something called a retrovirus, and you're going to learn about what a retrovirus is. But first of all, let me back up a sec. I'm sure you've heard AIDS. I'm, heard, I'm sure you've heard the term AIDS. I'm sure you've heard the term um, HIV. So AIDS is the disease that you get by HIV, the virus HIV. For example, COVID-19 is the disease. This is an intended work topic for you because you want to look that up. What is the name of the virus that causes COVID-19? Because again, COVID-19 is the disease. The virus has a different name. Anyway, let's talk about what a retrovirus is. I might ask you questions about this on the exam, and if I do, you would need to know that a retrovirus is an RNA virus. So remember, of all the viruses we've talked about, there's been DNA viruses and RNA viruses, and that's it, right? Because again, genes, excuse me, viruses are basically genes in a box. So what kind of genes? In this case, RNA. But it's interesting, it's a little bit different than anything we've learned so far because it reproduces with a DNA molecule. So it's an RNA virus, but it does its reproduction with DNA. And that seems completely odd, right? Because I haven't said anything like that. How does that work? Well, first of all, this is the reverse of the DNA-RNA flow, because I keep saying, and you also need to know this for the exam, other than this one exception, it always goes from DNA to RNA to protein. Right? So here, we're kind of going backwards. Instead of going from DNA to RNA, we're going from RNA to DNA. So, this is not transcription, right? This is reverse transcription. And if you can remember that this is reverse transcription, you can remember this name of the enzyme that does it, which is called reverse transcriptase. And that very well, yeah, any of these would be a good test question if I were going to ask you about a retrovirus. And I'm not sure if I will or not. But if I do, every single bullet point on there is important, right? It's RNA, and it's backwards. It goes from RNA to DNA, and that we use for first transcript case. Um, any questions about that slide? Okay. I will say this, another good reminder. When I say, hey, this is a good idea for an independent work topic, you do what you want, but my recommendation is wait until after class and look it up. If you're looking up something as I'm teaching something, then you're just kind of you're not getting your, your money's worth for your tuition. Anyway, here's a picture, a general picture of what it looks like. You can see it has the membrane like a lot of the animal viruses we've looked at. And then inside you have the box of protein that has the, the genetic material. And again, in this case, the genetic material is RNA. And then of course it has its own enzyme to do the reverse transcription, which again is called reverse transcriptase. So that picture is basically everything we talked about earlier. Um, this next slide is gonna show you how it works. Get it pulled up here. Looks like we're missing a little bit. No, that's it. So here we go. We had the viral RNA. This is where, you know, once the virus attached itself and inserted its genetic material, it also inserted the reverse transcriptase. So the reverse transcriptase reads the viral RNA, right? But instead of making protein, it goes backwards. So it reads the RNA and makes a strand of DNA. 
At which point some more things happen. You can look that up for independent work, because I'm just saying more things happen. I don't have time to get into what exactly happens, but from there, we go from a single strand of DNA to a double strand of DNA, and then here's where it gets a little bit nastier again. That double strand of DNA is then incorporated into your genome, right? So it's not happening, you know, not everything's happening in the cytoplasm. It's actually incorporated into your genome, genome, and then the process is basically normal, right? Then we have RNA polymerase comes in and does basically the transcription that you learned last week. It reads it, it makes a molecule of RNA, mRNA to be exact, that comes out of the uh, nucleus, and then you know it's transcribed to being translated. All the proteins are put together. We make a new virus. It escapes and then goes on to uh, goes on to kill other viruses or infect other cells. Excuse me. So, any questions about this slide? All right. For the exam, I'm going to put a big X to this because I'm not going to ask you all these details. I'm not going to be like, all right, when when HIV infects a cell, what happens in step two or what happens on step four? I'm not going to ask you. You don't need to know what a provirus is. Um, yeah, so none of those details. So no questions? Okay, you download the PowerPoint. You can see an animation of what I just showed you. Um, your book talks about how HIV basically kills people. Um, it kills the white blood cells. The white blood cells are important to the immune system. So a lot of times you can look at this up to for independent work if you want. Like what kills most HIV? People who have HIV, what disease kills the most? Because remember, they technically have AIDS. But usually, because this is a disease that attacks the immune system, usually something else kills them, right? Because they just their immune system is being killed by the HIV. Um, at, the, at the time this book was written, there was no cure. And it was slowed by two categories of drugs. Another good independent work topic for you if you want to look it up. Um, because things have started to change a little bit since this was published. Um, so you can look up HIV cure and see what you find and write about that if you want. Um, but because of that, because of the fact that this might be slightly um, dated, I'm going to put a big X to it because I'm not going to ask you questions about it on the exam. But just so you know, there are two types of categories, excuse me, two categories of drugs that um, help slow down the virus, slow down the infection. The first one inhibits uh, protease enzymes. What are protease enzymes? Those are the things that produce the HIV proteins, which should make sense, right? Isn't it? Protein, excuse me. Enzymes are named from what they do. So you kind of almost guess protease, that sounds like protein, and it ends with ACE, so you know it's an enzyme. So yeah, those are the things that kind of put the proteins together, right? So we know through translation that the proteins are made, and then we have those enzymes that take those proteins and assemble, assemble them to make a new virus. So that's the first type, and it is that. Because you also learned about enzyme inhibitors, right? Way back in chapter three. Um, and the second type inhibits reverse transcriptase itself. So remember, I told you there's that enzyme <coughs> that reads the RNA molecule and makes a new DNA molecule out of it. Well, the second drug inhibits that. And this picture will show you how. So if, hopefully this is a good reminder to, to, from important stuff. Um, remember how translation, excuse me, transcription works. You read the code, you bring in the, the next base, right? And that's how you make the double strand. So in this case, you know, when there should be a T, and somebody's been taking this drug, the enzyme uh, doesn't know any better. So it puts this thing in, right? Because chemically, look at that. Structure and function, that thing looks almost exactly alike. So the enzyme doesn't know any better. It puts it in. But here's the big difference. Here we have an OH, here we have an N3. I know you guys aren't chemists. Well, what I can tell you here, and hopefully you recognize it just from your position itself, that OH is where you have the, the bond, right? The covalent bond with the next nucleotide. Here, because you have an N3, again, I know you're not a chemist, but basically, long story short, the N3 cannot bond to anything else. So if you put in this instead of this, then that's the end of the line, right? The, the, they're trying to make a, a new strand of DNA that won't work because that thing is not going to covalently bond to anything else. And that's how that works. And again, a big X to that because I'm not going to ask you anything from that on the exam. But are there any questions about it? All right, the last thing we're going to talk about for this chapter, and then we're going to jump into the next chapter today, are prions. And that will also be the next attendance word. Prion, P R I O N S. What are they? You've probably heard of them. We talked about them at the very beginning of the chapter when I showed you a picture of the cow. The prions are infectious proteins. 
but they're not viruses. We're done talking about viruses. They are infectious proteins. What they do is they cause brain diseases. They're basically a misfolded form of a normal brain protein. And what happens is when it gets into a cell that has a normal protein, it converts that normal protein to the misfolded version. And then those things start clumping together. Basically, it puts holes in your brain. Um, and if anything, for the exam, the most important bullet points are prions are infectious proteins that cause brain diseases. Well, let us say basically all of them at the bottom. They're infectious proteins, infectious misfolded proteins to be exact, that cause brain disease. That's what prions are. And that's what you would need to know for the exam. The next slide I'm going to show you is a bunch of examples of different prions different diseases caused by prions. I'm not going to ask you any of those for the exam, but we'll talk about them very quickly. I'll introduce them to you. Are there any questions about this slide? All right, here's a list of some of them. You can look up, there's some other ones. Scrappy and sheep, chronic wasting disease, and deer and elk, mad cow disease. I would say that's the more um, well-known one, but I remember at the beginning of the chapter, I asked if anybody had heard that, nobody. If I remember correctly, nobody had heard of it, but anyway. Then we've got even some some uh, brain ones, excuse me, some human ones. You can look these up. There's another one. I think I have it on a, uh, an upcoming slide, but there's another one called Kuru. You can look that up for independent work too. That one's interesting because it's caused, or not caused, but it was very often spread by cannibalism. So it's a human disease, and it was caused by humans eating other humans. And it's a slightly interesting topic if you want to look into it for independent work. Anyway, like I said, these are just some examples. You don't need to know them for the exam. You could look this up for, for independent work. Again, I give, I've given you some, but you can look up, think of your favorite animal, and see if, it, um, if they're affected by prions, and then see if that has an A. Um, are there any questions about that? All right. Then we get into the evolution connection, as we do at the end of every, um, every chapter, and I'll skip it as I always do, so it's not going to be on the exam, but it might be on the study guide. But this is at least worth talking about. This one's about emerging viruses. So this is one way that vaccines really help, right? Because fewer people who, and vaccines aren't perfect, but the, oops, the fewer people who are susceptible to get a disease and get the virus means there's a, a lower chance of people or the virus mutating, right? So yeah, that's basically it, right? Because you don't want the virus to mutate. Because sometimes what happens when the virus mutates is that the vaccines that you currently have no longer work. And so far, we've been okay with that with COVID-19 for the most part, but uh, that could change easily. Plus, keep in mind that COVID or the virus that causes COVID-19, that's a new virus. And it just didn't appear out of thin, thin air. That was a virus that mutated from some other virus that had, you know, wasn't affecting humans. So again, um, just something to think about with virus mutations. Anyway, are there any questions about chapter 10? All right, I'm gonna pull up the next chapter, just because it's really early and we are a little bit behind. And I'll remind you again, we are now, since we're now done with chapter 10, that means we have done with everything for the next exam. So chapter eight, chapter nine, chapter 10, that's gonna be on the next exam. If you have um, an idea of when you wanna take the exam, send me an email today. Here we go. And also, I highly recommend doing the study guides because the study guides will give you independent work points. And again, I use the study guides to write the exam. But take those questions, the exact questions you've already had, and every word. Also, one last thing on that topic. Um, when you send me the email to tell me when you want to take the exam, if you also you have a preference of when you would like to do the, um, the review, let me know. Also, and then I'm done, I promise. Speaking of that, I've already done an exam review for previous semesters, right, previous students, and it's already on Google Classroom. So I highly recommend watching those. This is the third exam now, right? And there's been, there's been some consistencies in the past two exams, and for some reason, still people haven't watched the exam videos or the exam review videos when there's a lot of extra points in there. So that's just a big hint. Please watch the videos. You don't have to, but, you know, I highly, highly recommend it. So anyway, any questions about any of that? All right, let's jump into the next chapter. To me, this is where biology gets really real fun. Now, my thesis was in genetics, so 
you might think that that's my favorite part of biology is looking at all the cellular stuff, but it's not. My favorite stuff is what we're about to learn. So up to this point, everything we've learned when you think about it has been about cells, right? Yep, you can say that, right? Like photosynthesis was about cells, respiration, we learned about cellular reproduction, mitosis, which happens in cells. When we talk about genetics, we were looking at what's happening in the cells. Um, obviously, what we just finished, chapter 10, we're looking at DNA and going from DNA to RNA to protein, that's all cellular. But from here on out, for the rest of the rest of the semester, we're no longer looking at cells. We're looking at how individuals interact, how organisms interact. This is my favorite. Again, this is big, big biology. Anyway, let's play the guessing game. Your picture, if we're talking about biology, now your book has this picture of a burger. Can anybody tell what that little thing is right there in the burger? Yeah, it's a tomato. Any idea what they might be getting at, what your book might be getting at, to have that picture? That little tiny tomato on the burger. No guesses? That's okay. Basically, what your book is getting at here is there's something called artificial selection, which is a type of evolution, right? That's when humans direct evolution. And your book is getting at the fact that that's what tomatoes used to look like. Of course, some of them still do, right? Some varieties. But all tomatoes used to be about the size of blueberry. Um, but then humans intervened, and we made them larger, and now you have the tomatoes that you see today, which is another good independent work topic. If you're interested, look up your foods, your favorite foods. Think about vegetables. You might be surprised what they used to look like. Most of them looked nothing like they do today. I get off the top of my head, I can tell you watermelons used to be about smaller than the size of my fist, and they weren't juicy, they weren't sweet. Uh, corn used to look like, like literally just grass. So it's worth looking into if you want. All right, here's what I, I bet no one gets is this, but let's see. Any idea? Well, first, you might know what those things are. Cheetahs. Cheetahs, good. Can anybody guess what they might have to do with evolution? Like specifically them. Nothing, nothing general, because you could say, oh yeah, they evolved from something else, which is true. But it's a little bit more specific. Any guesses why your book might be bringing up cheetahs? That's okay. Your book says, or points out, that the cheetah may be racing towards extinction. So there's been twice in their history when they've almost gone extinct. Um, and then later in the semester, we're actually going to talk about that, how they don't have very much genetic diversity and how that's also putting them in danger. But yeah, they're about to go extinct. Um, and it has a lot to do with uh, evolution. And you'll see why um, later. How about this? There are kids scratching his head. What might that have to do with evolution? I guess it's all right. It talks about head lice, right? So when you get head lice, you get these certain medications that are supposed to kill them. But your book points out that sometimes people get these super infections again because of evolution, right? If you just start killing all the, all the head lice with the same medication, then eventually there's going to be a head lice that can survive, it, right? Because it had some random mutation in one of its genes that allows it to survive it, and if it survives. The medication you give it and then it goes on to reproduce then all of its descendants are going to be immune to that medication right and we'll talk about stuff like that so it's not just headlights we're worried about when it comes to that but uh, other stuff too so any questions about this side all right let's jump into it it's one of my favorite chapters you can see this is a long one usually we got about three main bullet points we have one two three four five six of them now before i jump in i want to say this because this is the, fit, the first big mistake people make we're talking about evolution in this chapter. And in this chapter, we will discuss natural selection. I want to point out now, and keep this in the back of your mind, natural selection is a type of evolution. There's all kinds of evolution. Natural selection is the big one when we talk the most about it, but it is not the only way things evolve. So keep that in mind. Natural selection doesn't necessarily, excuse me, evolution does not necessarily equal natural selection, right? They have different meanings. Natural selection is a type of evolution. Another thing I want to point out, so far, this hasn't happened. But uh, if, if you're like somebody who says, "I don't believe in I don't believe in evolution. This is against my beliefs." Um, that's fine. I'm not here to change your beliefs, but you still need to know it, right? To understand biology, you need to understand uh, what we know about evolution. So even if you don't believe in it, you still need to go out to know it. And then finally, the other thing I'll point out is evolution, as you're going to learn, doesn't always mean. Like usually, when people say what the, they don't believe in evolution, what they usually mean is. They don't believe we came from an ancestral, you know, ape-like species. That's usually what they mean. 
you'll learn here that it's not just about that. As a matter of fact, we don't talk too much about that in this chapter. It's also the fact that, you know, people are changing. We see things change. We see dogs change. We see all kinds of things change. The natural selection is happening all around us. We'll talk about that. And it's not, again, it's not always going from one species to the next. Sometimes species themselves just change without changing into a new species. Anyway, the first thing we're talking about is the diversity of life. And that'll bring you to the first term that you need to know for this portion of the next exam, right? So taxonomy. You need to know what taxonomy is. And that is the branch of biology that deals with identifying, naming, and classifying species. Taxonomy. We use the Linnaean system to do this. Look him up if you want. Linnaeus, friend of work, slightly interesting person. Anyway, the Linnaean system is a method of naming species. And to do that, we use a hierarchy. What do I mean by that? I mean, like, we start very specifically, and then we have broader and broader categories. Like, for example, I drive a red F-150 pickup truck, right? That's very specific. But then that itself belongs into a broader category where I can say I drive an F-150. And then that itself could be in a broader category where I say I drive a Ford. Then that could be a broader category. I'd say I drive an American-made vehicle, right? So all, you see what I'm saying? That's what hierarchy means. And I'll show you some, uh, some examples as we move forward. Are there any questions about this slide? All right, then let's talk about naming and classifying the diversity of life. Get a little bit more specific about the Linnaean system. Here's what you need to know. If we're talking about the scientific name, it's a two-part Latinized name. It's binomial. I guess, if anything, on this first main bullet point, what you really need to know is that it's two parts, but you probably already know that. I'm sure you've all heard the term homo sapien, for example, right? Because that's a human, homo sapien. Homo being the first word, or the first part, sapien being the second part, so you're already familiar with that. What you might not know, what you need to know for the exam, is the first part of that word is the genus, and the second part is the species within that genus. So even though there are no other species in the Homo genus, there used to be. That's another thing you can look up for independent work if you want. So right now, Homo sapiens are the only things left in the genus of Homo. But there are other ones. I'm sure you've heard of them. I think I'm sure you've heard of the term caveman, right? Anyway, so know that. First part's the genus, second part's the species. The two part together, again, those are what we use to name species. Your book gives this example of that black panther we saw. They are part I'm going to put an X to that just to remind you that this is just an example. This is not a class about panthers, so I'm not going to ask you specifically what that is. But if you were to get a question like, if I were to present this to you in an exam, I might say, you know, which part is the genus, which part is the species? And again, Panthera would be the genus, Paris would be the species, and you wouldn't even know that. As a matter of fact, there's a question on the study guide that's very similar to this. It doesn't use, um, doesn't use that animal, but it does. It gives you a scientific name, and then from that, you have to understand or answer, you know, what's the genus, what's the species? It even asks you, I think, maybe what the order of the class is, but we'll talk about that when we get there. Another thing you should know, even though, I don't know, for you guys, this might be a little bit less, less important, but when we're talking about this, notice that the first letter is always capitalized, the second one is always not capitalized, and it's always in italics. So, if you were to write it properly, that's the way it would look. Some of you have read it in properly, for example, in uh, independent work, and you never lost points for it, because you didn't even know that, but I would just correct you and say, hey, just so you know, it's always in italics, First one's always uh, uppercase, second one's not. But moving forward for independent work, now if you make that mistake, you will lose maybe a point. Because now you know better. Anyway, why would we do this, right? Let me back up. What would you guys call that? I mean, forget that we're talking about biology. If some kid showed you a picture of that and said, hey, what is this? I know you're in biology. What is that? What would you call it? 
panther, right? I would maybe call it that too, right? So then why? Why not just call it a panther? Why do we have to go and call it panthera partis? What's the meaning behind it, or what's the use behind it, other than trying to trick biology students? Any guesses? I mean, it's actually right here, but it's to remove ambiguity. For example, and I need to find a better example because I'm from the South, so to me this makes a lot of sense, but I find historically most people don't, don't know what's going on here. But does anybody know what that is? I mean, yes, it's a fish. Does anybody know what kind of fish? Yeah, good. It's the kind of fish you eat, right? Mahi mahi. This is the scientific name, right? And the reason we have scientific name is funny. I'm glad you called it that. Everybody now, I think, who does know what it is, a lot of people don't know what it is, but when they do know, that is usually what they say. Mahi mahi. But mahi mahi is the term from uh, the Hawaii region, right? So that's what they call it. And that's also happens to be the new popular name. It used to be called, more popular, dolphin. And when I was a kid living in the Keys, that's what they call it. So when you're up with the menu, they had dolphin on the menu for a while before they adopted Mahi Mahi, but it used to freak people out because they dolphin and they think a flipper, you know, like a bottlenose dolphin. And it's not that at all, right? So anyway, yeah, Mahi Mahi dolphin. Um, if you're in Spanish, or if you're saying it in Spanish, is Dorado, Dorado, Cheetah, if you're in Japan, right? So that's why we have scientific names. The point here is, Depending on where you go in the world, they might call it a different thing. But no matter what, no matter where you go in the world, as long as they're you know scientifically literate, they're going to use that um, scientific name that we've all agreed upon. Put a big X to this. I'm not going to ask you about mahi mahi. Though extra credit if you bring me some mahi mahi for lunch one day. Just kidding. Don't do that. Anyway. Linnaeus introduced the system of grouping species again into hierarchy of categories. That's the next important thing we need to know. So now you know what the species name is. The next thing you need to know, and I'm sure you've been introduced to this before, is knowing the category, categories, and how they fit into each other. So we already know that the smallest thing we have is species, right? So we have multiple species in the same genus. We have multiple genus in the same order. And then we have multiple orders in a class, multiple classes into a phyla or phylum, and multiple phylums and kingdoms, and then kingdoms into domains. You need to know that. What is it that they used to say? King Philip. Uh, does anybody remember? I should, I should know this, but I just haven't memorized, so I don't remember the little saying. I'll come up with it and let you know. But there's a way to memorize this, but you need to know this in order up and down, right? So you need to know the most specific would be species, and then the most broad would be domains. And that's also interesting things, in my opinion, to look up for independent work. I'm going to go to the next slide. It still has this information. It just looks a little bit different. Like you could look, just pick your favorite creature and see at what point we diverge from them. Because we are humans, right? So we are eukaryotes. We're not bacteria, right? We're not prokaryotes. We're eukaryotes. So we're in the same domain as this cat. Um, we're all animals, right? So we're in the same kingdom. We all have backbones. So we're all in the same phylum of cord Cordata, Cordata. We're all mammals, right? So we're in the same class. So you can go on and on. Pick your favorite creature. See how far it is before we uh, before we diverge, if you will. Or just pick your favorite creature and don't even compare it to humans if you want. And just figure out. Tell me all this. You know, if you, if you like dogs, tell me the. Uh, domain, kingdom, file, class, order, family, genus, species. Anyway, any questions about that? Again, for the exam, please understand that. Please know this in order. Right? Know that we go from broader to more specific. Domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Then once you have that memorized and understood, then maybe try to make sure you understand it and memorize it the other way. The most specific species, and then that goes into genus, and then family, and then order. Class, file, kingdom, uh, eukarya, domain. I will point this out too. This is the Bio 101 version, right? This is the 100 level non biology major version. This is actually a little bit more complicated in real life. So if you look up your favorite creature, whether it be an animal or a plant or a fungi or whatever, you might find there's something called like a subclass 
or, or excuse me, subphylum or super order, right? So it's not always this kind of drive, but for, for, for what we need to know, that's it's good enough. Anyway, any questions about this? The next slide I'm going to show you is the same thing. It's just from a different textbook, so it looks a little bit different. Here we're going from top down to show you, you know, domain, kingdom, phylum, class. Oh, that's a good, here we go. Subphylum, see this one even includes subphylum because it's not from your textbook. Class, order, family, genus, species. And again, these are just examples. I'm not going to ask you anything about this. Um, yeah, so be familiar with it. Plus, there's a lot of people, not this is a big, big deal, but people make these kind of mistakes all the time. And my wife actually, my wife makes it all the time, and she kind of gets pissed at me. Because somebody, you know, will talk about animals, and I'll mention that humans are animals. She's like, I know, but that's confused. She says it's confusing the kids. But that's not. Humans are animals, right? We all, humans are in the kingdom of animalia, right? Humans are animals. So are insects. That's another thing that blows people, I think people think that's weird. But yes, insects are animals. Jellyfish are animals, right? So not that you can know that for the exam, but people make those mistakes a lot. Well, really, it makes my wife mad is when people call a, an insect a bug and I correct them. I'm like, no, they're not all bugs. There's a certain uh, family of bugs that are, excuse me, a certain family of insects that are called bugs, but they're not all bugs. Anyway, any questions about that side? All right, your book also points this out. Especially historically speaking, the criteria used to place them in this genus, in this family, in this phylum, whatever, Ultimately, it's arbitrary. I mean, there are rules. Humans have come together and made rules to say, all right, this is, you know, it has a backbone and it is in this file. It produces milk and has hair. It's a mammal, right? So we've made rules, but it's humans that came up with these rules, right? Because they're just trying to categorize things. And after you learn about the process by which the diversity of life evolved, like how did we, how did life get there, not how did humans decide this is categorize that. Then I'm going to introduce you to a classification system based on an understanding of evolutionary relationships. And it just so happens that even though it's arbitrary, this system right here turned out to be pretty accurate for the most part. So basically what I'm saying is all this was based on some arbitrary rules. And then we started learning more about evolution and we could start looking at things molecularly. And then things started shifting around a little bit because then we learned, okay, well, actually, it turns out this thing is more related to this thing than it is that thing. And they made some adjustments because that's what science does. When there's a better understanding, it changed things. And we'll learn about that towards the end of the uh, chapter. Uh, the next word for attendance, let's say pumpkin. Since it's Halloween, pumpkin will be the next word for attendance. Not jack o' lantern, but pumpkin. Anyway, if you download this PowerPoint, you can click that um, click that link, and it'll take you to a video. I don't. I think it's a pretty short video that talks about taxonomy. There's no questions about the slide. We'll move forward. Again, we're still talking about the diversity of life, and now we're going to kind of explain it. Excuse me. The explanation of the origin of the diversity of life is basically evolution. Right. So, how is it that we have such a diverse, well, when we're talking about taxonomy, how is it so diverse? And the answer is basically evolution. Now granted, I'm going to put it next to that because that's not a test question. This slide is basically just an introduction to what we're going to learn. It was originally proposed by Charles, Dar whoa, by Charles Darwin. You should know that. I'm not quite sure how many questions I'm going to have about him on the, uh, the exam. Maybe none. This is in the history class. You kind of need to understand the history of biology to understand it, but I don't know. Anyway, it was proposed by Charles Darwin. The book that he proposed it in was called On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection. It was published in 1859. It's a decent movie, and I think I've already got it on Google Classroom, but if not, I'll find it and share it with you. You can watch it and answer it for, you know, answer the points for the pen work. But it's more of a movie, or it was a documentary. It's either a definite movie or documentary, or maybe I have one of each. But it's not like you know one of those short videos that I show you of Hank, where it's strictly um, educational. It's meant to be um, entertaining. But anyway, I'll try to share that with you. So, 
again, Charles Darwin was the one that came up with this idea of natural selection. However, he was not the first person, obviously, to try to explain the origins. Like, where did we all come from? That's what he, that's what he answered. Where did we all come from? That's what he answered. But as you know, he was not the first person to do it. Let's talk about some of the other ones. Um, I might ask you this. Again, it's not history class, but this is kind of nice to show you where we're coming from. As far as we know, the first people who were to talk about it were you know, the Greeks, Aristotle. He said that species are fixed permanent forms and they don't change over time. So basically, his idea of origins, where we came from, was there was no evolution, right? So things were just created the way they were and nothing changes. Aristotle said that. Also around the same time, you know, you have the Judeo-Christian beliefs, which basically say the same thing, right? Everything was created about 6,000 years ago, I think is what they say. And again, it's never changed. And if you believe, you know, if you read it, to take it literally, then that's what you can come up with. Anyway, if you download this PowerPoint, you can also click that picture of Aristotle and see a short little video about him. You can click that picture of the Bible and see a short little video about the biblical beliefs of our origins. Um, then, about the 1600s, Religious scholars estimated that the earth was 6,000 years old. So like I said earlier, again, I'm just giving you the history of where we came from. Talk about our understanding of our origins. So at that point in the 1600s, the idea that all living species came into being relatively recently, because 6,000 years is relatively recently, and unchanging, that's what they, that's the, the idea that dominated for centuries. And in some places, and maybe even for you, that idea still dominates, right? So people still believe that the earth is 6,000 years old. And every single species that is on Earth is made that way and hasn't changed. Which is, again, if you take things literally from the Bible, then that's what you would lead to. Which brings me to questions about, like, and again, this is good for an uh, independent work topic if you want, like the ark. So if the whole world flooded, then everything was in salt water. So what happened to all the freshwater fish? What happened to, if everything was in the desert, then how did we get all the old living animals and plants for that matter and we get them all to the desert anyway let's move forward so that was around the 1600s and again for some people still meanwhile even though this was the prevailing thought meanwhile we had naturalists who were finding fossils and they're like what in the world is this because in their mind the world was only 6,000 years old and the species have always been the same Nothing's gone extinct, right? So they're like, what in the world are these things? Speaking of which, you also need to know what they are, and the book definition of a fossil is imprints or remains of organisms that lived in the past. And we'll talk more about fossils as we move forward. So that's just your first introduction. We're going to talk about all the different types of fossils, but for now, let's move forward. Are there any questions so far? All right, again, this idea of the fossils. Um, Fossils were thought to be the remains of living creatures, right? So, because again, in their mind, things only 6,000 years old, nothing changes, nothing's gone extinct, so surely these things that we're finding must be living creatures. Um, so they find these fossils a lot, and they call those snake stones. Because again, in their mind, they've never seen a creature, or the only creature they'd ever seen that looked anything like that was a snake. So they just assumed that every time they found these fossils, these were fossils of snakes that just didn't have them up their head. But then finally, some people started to think, well, this something's up, right? Because sometimes the fossils don't look like anything that's alive today. So around the 1800s, there were some discoveries about some, again, like these more interesting, if you will, these more different fossils. And that had convinced a lot of people finally that, all right, Maybe there have been some extinctions. Which, think about it, that's a big deal back then. Because when you're saying there have been some extinctions, what you're saying to everybody who's ever believed otherwise is that all the species on Earth that we know of have not always been that way, right? There are some species that are no longer with us. That's the first thing. It was a big paradigm shift. The second thing was um, things change, right? They're not always that way. Or, excuse me. The second, I just said that. The second thing was that clearly, if we're talking about these fossils, they just, I mean, they didn't know for sure, but that's a big hint that things must be older than 6,000 years old. Anyway, your book uses this ichthyosaur as, as an example. 
If you click that picture, you can watch a quick little video about it. Um, but I'm going to put it next to this because that's definitely not details I'm going to ask you about. Are there any questions? All right. Now let's talk about the big one. We still haven't gotten to Charles Darwin yet because remember, we're going through history here. We haven't gotten to Charles Darwin, but there was a big one before him who almost got it right. And you might need to know about him for the exam. I'm not sure yet. But again, at this time, we had naturalists that were comparing fossils with living species, right? So they're looking at these things, like that ichthyosaur fossil I just showed you, or maybe the snake stones. They're looking at fossils, they're looking at things that are alive, and clearly they can tell, like, this looks a lot like that thing that's alive. So clearly they must be related somehow, but also clearly they're different, so they're obviously not the same species, right? They, were, they knew enough back then to understand that, right? There's something going on. How are things different yet the same? And then in the early 1800s, we had this French naturalist named Jean-Baptiste de Lamarck. His suggestion was, the reason we have all these different things, is because life evolves. So when you think about it, as far as we know, he's the first person to propose evolution. Now, as you'll see as we move forward, he didn't propose the right mechanism for it, but he did propose the fact that life changes over time. So he kind of gets props for that, right? He was the first. Any questions about that so far? All right. He explained slash proposed that evolution, excuse me, evolution is the refinement of traits that equip organisms to perform successfully in their environments. And that's not exactly wrong. And we'll talk about that. I'm going to put an X to this. You should understand this, but I'm not going to necessarily ask you. But again, he was saying that evolution makes things refined. Right? Whatever trait it is that an organism has, to help survive its environment, that's what evolution is, right? So maybe cheetahs becoming faster throughout the generations, or lions having sharper claws throughout the generations, or turtles having harder shells from generation to generation, right? That would be um, refinement of those traits. So that part is kind of correct, that first bullet point. Where he got it wrong was this next one. By using or not using the body parts, an individual may develop certain traits it passes on to the offspring. Um, for example, he thinks or thought that the reason giraffes have long necks is because, you know, you had some, you had a bunch of giraffes and they eat leaves out of trees. So they're stretching the neck, right? Constantly stretching the neck, trying to eat the leaves. So since they're stretching the neck, they thought their offspring would be born with slightly larger necks because the parents were stretching, right? So then the offspring are born with slightly longer necks. And they spend their lives stretching their necks. Therefore, their offspring are going to be born with slightly longer necks, right? And that is where he got it wrong, right? So his idea that things evolve and refine, that's true. He got that right. But his idea of how species evolve was mistaken. So again, to be clear, that is not how it happens. That's not how giraffes got longer necks. It's not by using a part or not using a part. You know, if that were the case, I'd be like, if you had two really fit you know, a really fit mom and a really fit dad, they're, they're always working out, really buff and athletic, and then that would, then their kids would be that way too, right? Born buff and athletic, right? And that's not how it works. So his proposal that species evolved as a result of interactions between them and their environment, that was true, and that is what helped set the stage for Darwin. So Darwin didn't just come out of nowhere and, you know, come up with this idea completely. Someone at least already said, hey, look, Things evolve and traits are refined. So, any questions about this slide? That brings us finally to Charles Darwin, right? So, when we're talking about the history, the timeline, that finally brings us to, to Darwin. Um, I'll put it next to this. This is just for your own information. Nothing's going to be tested. I'm not going to test you on any of this, but Charles Darwin was born in 1809. Uh, coincidentally, on the same exact day as Abraham Lincoln. Yeah. Come look that up if you want, even though it's almost not biology related, but what exactly was the date? Um, he was fascinated with nature as a boy, so his whole life he's been curious with nature. It wasn't a new thing. He did go to medical school, but he kind of flunked out or quit it because he found medicine boring and surgery horrifying, which kind of makes sense, right? Because back then, he didn't exactly put people to sleep and have nice, uh, clean, um, Surgery room, right? Things were horrible back then. Anyway, and this is where it gets interesting to me and relevant. 
after quitting medical school, so he got, you know, again, a lot of scientific knowledge. Then he studied to be a clergyman. So it's not like he didn't understand religion. He studied to be a clergyman, right? He knows about religion. So it's not like everything, he came up with all this because he was anti-religion or because he didn't understand religion. He did. But then at the age of 22, he began a voyage on a ship called the HMS Beagle, and that helped him frame his theory of evolution. And that's what we're going to talk about, is his trip on the HMS Beagle. To, so to kind of explain what he learned, when he learned it, and how it brought him to what he figured, finally figured out. So Darwin's journey. Yeah, I'll put it next to this, too. You don't necessarily need to know this. But the Beagle was a survey ship, so that was the purpose of that, that ship that he was on. It wasn't a warship or a merchant ship. It was a survey ship. Um, and I guess the only reason that would be relevant to us is because, you know, if you're trying to make a map, you're going to need to, need to see a lot of spots, right? You need to see the whole coast. You need to make a lot of stops. You need to see things. And he did that. He was on shore a lot. And he spent his time on shore exploring. Um, he collected a lot of fossils. He also collected a lot of living plants and living animals. I mean, he has a, there's a whole collection still alive today of this stuff. You guys know who Steve Irwin is? The crocodile guy who died? Um, Anyway, that was what, 20 years ago at the most? Anyway, he used to own a, a big old giant tortoise. And his tortoise was Darwin's tortoise, because they lived to be really, really old. So Darwin got this tortoise back when he was touring the world in the 1800s, and then still to that day, you know, the thing survived so long that Steve Irwin had it. Anyway, again, like I said, he was collecting fossils, he was collecting living things, he was also keeping detailed journals of his observations. So it wasn't like he was just hanging out like, oh, this is cool, this is cool. He was taking very detailed notes, which almost makes sense, you know, because maybe if he had an iPhone, instead of taking detailed notes, he'd just be taking selfies or, you know, pictures of him at the beach with his feet up. I don't know. But without the ability to do that, he actually had to write down what he saw. And he did. Detailed journals. Um, and in these journals, he was noting the characteristics of the plants and animals that made them well suited to the diverse environment. So he was seeing all these different things. I'll show you the map, right? He went all over the place and saw all kinds of different things. And in that process, you know, he was seeing a lot of diversity. And he could see, like, all right, I can see how this organism fits in to this environment in South America. And I can see how that organism fits in right here at the Cape of Good Hope in South Africa. And how this organism fits in well in Tasmania, right? He could figure, he could see these things out. He was noticing those. So, um, any questions so far? All right, uh, he did a lot of his work, the big work that we talked about, in the Galapagos. And I'll talk more about that later, but their size and their location to each other and their location to the mainland of South America, that's not trivial. It's all pretty important. Um, and also the fact that they're volcanic, meaning, you guys not, might not know this, but that means they are relatively new. So South America mainland is an older mass, it's an older piece of land than these, because these came from volcanoes way after South America, we can just, I won't even get into it, but South America been there way longer than on those islands. And again, that will be important later when I start discussing what he figured out, which is a great place to end it. So the last word for attendance, let's see, let's just say new, not old, but new. That's it, any questions? All right, I'm looking forward to getting caught up with grading. Um, I'll let you know when I'm caught up. You guys had a great week. Have a good day. You too.